touching though. Good morning. I invite you all to take a hymnal, turn to number 425, and we'll sing the first verse, and you can move around and make somebody welcome, so if, you please, if you're able, please stand, and then we'll sing the last four verses also. We're going to sing all five of these. Bye. 
may be seated. Turn now, if you will, to 340.
there now, if you will, to 243. We'll slow it down just a little bit. There's a sweet, sweet spirit in this place. Father, we thank you and praise you this morning for what we've already seen, what we've already heard, what we've already felt. We thank you for your presence in our lives. We thank you for the presence in our church. And as we come to this time, Lord, of partaking of the Lord's Supper, of thinking about your sacrifice for our sins, thinking about our lives in the light of your life and giving it for us that we might have life. We pray that you would touch each of us deeply during this time, Lord. We just ask that you would be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. At this time, our brothers are going to come. They're going to distribute the elements. Let's wait until everyone's received, and then we'll partake together.
Jesus said on the night he was betrayed, This is my body, broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Jesus said, this cup is the cup of the New Testament. My blood shed for the remission of your sins. This do in remembrance of me. Jesus said, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim my death until I come. Is death in the past? Is coming in the future? And here we live today, living in the light of what he's done, living in the light of what he's promised to do, living in the glorious light of our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, for the gift of life. Through your Son, we pray. Amen. So pass your cups to the center. Our brothers will collect them. Just remember in his word how he feeds the little bird. Take your burden to the Lord and leave it there. If your body suffers pain and your health you can't regain and your soul is almost sinking in, Jesus knows the pain you feel He can save and He can heal Take your burden to the Lord and leave it there Leave it there
have a Bible, I invite you to turn to Romans chapter 4, we'll make a brief stop there and then head back to Genesis chapter 12. We've been talking for several weeks about the promises of God. We've talked about that in many different aspects and details. I won't go over all that right now, maybe next week. It's on the internet if you got the internet and you like that kind of thing. You can listen to all those over again. But this morning, we want to think about the man who lived on promises, and that, of course, is Abraham. If you read Romans chapter 4, Galatians chapter 3, Hebrews chapter 11, you'll find Abraham mentioned with the promises of God 20 times. That's about a third of all the references in the Bible to somebody living by the promises, standing on the promises of God. And Abraham is the person who most pictures that process that you and I are engaged in as we live in this world. And so we want to look at him and how he did it and how we can do it. Romans 4, he says, What shall we say then that Abraham, our father, is pertaining to the flesh, is found? If Abraham were justified by works, he has where it of to glory, but not before God. What says the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now note that in verse 3. It doesn't say Abraham believed in God, although certainly he did. But it says Abraham believed God. That's what it takes to live on the promises. Believing in God will get your soul to heaven, but believing God will get heaven to your soul. Believing in God, you can have life, John 10.10, but believing God, you can have life more abundantly, Jesus said. So there are many sincere people who have believed in God. They're going to heaven. But they're presently maybe not believing God, living by the promises, trusting God, walking by faith, not by sight. And that's what Abraham teaches us. Look at verse uh, 20. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, being fully persuaded that what he had promised, there it is, he was able also to perform. So what were these promises that Abraham lived by? Let's turn back to Genesis chapter 12 and just kind of walk along with Abraham through the majority of his life and see how God fulfilled those promises to him. Genesis 12, 1, 2, and 3. Abraham is 75 years old. Some of you think, well, I'm too old to live by the promises of God. <laughs> Abraham didn't start till he's 75, and he's going to do it for a long, long time. Some of you may think, I'm too young to live by the promises of God. Well, you think about Daniel, you think about Joseph, you think about other Bible characters we won't talk about today. And everybody great we think of in the faith was someone who trusted God and just walked out on his promises and let him lead them and guide them. So this is where Abraham starts it. You see there in verse 1, it's the Lord, all capital letters. It's L-O-R-D. That's the covenant name of God. So God came to, to Abraham to make a covenant with him, a covenant relationship. We just remembered a covenant relationship. Jesus said this is the new covenant or the new testament in my blood. So God is coming and talking to Abraham in covenantal terms. And he says, the Lord had said to Abram, get out of your country from your kindred. From your father's house and the land that I will show you, I'll make of thee a great nation. I'll bless thee and make thy name great, and you shall be a blessing. I'll bless them that bless you, curse them that curse you, and thee, all families of the earth, shall be blessed. This is what's commonly called the Abrahamic covenant, or the, the covenant to Abraham. And there's several things here. Notice the I wills over and over again. It's an unconditional promise. Abraham wasn't always as faithful as he should have been. The nation of Israel, which came from Abraham, always hasn't been as faithful as they should have been. But God said, I will, five times here, over and over. No conditions to it. Not I will if you will, but I will. And the covenant basically revolves around three promises. The promises of a people, promises of a land. We call that the promised land or Israel today, uh, geopolitically. And the promise of a blessing. He said, I'll make you a blessing and I'll bless them that bless you and so on and so forth. So that was the original covenant promises given to Abraham. Now turn over to chapter 15. Abraham was 75 when the promise was given. Of course, he had no children. 
had no promise of that until God came and promised it to him. And in chapter 15, when you turn there, let's start at verse uh, 13. What you just did was turn 10 years in Abraham's life. 10 years have gone by rather quickly. Nothing has happened. And as we've said through this study, a lot of times God will give us a promise, but then there'll be time in between. There's a purpose for that time. There's a purpose for that process that happens to us. Once we see a promise in the Word of God and we believe that promise, sometimes depending on the size of the promise, the time may be longer or shorter. So Abraham is now 85. Nothing's happened. And uh, in uh, chapter 15, verse 13, he said to Abram, God again, No, surely your seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs and shall serve them. They shall afflict them 400 years. Now he's referring to Moses coming later and the people in Egypt is what he's talking about. Also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge and afterward they shall come out with great substance. If you read the book of Exodus, you know that's exactly what happened. And you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried in a good old age. We'll get to that in a few minutes. But in the fourth generation, they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. Verse 18, In the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt, that's the Nile River, unto the great river Euphrates, that's in modern-day Iraq. So what living in the promises does for us and why it's so important is because it protects us from several dangers. If you live by the promises of God, if you trust God, if you walk by faith and not by sight, by your very obedience, by your very willingness to do it God's way, you will protect yourself from certain dangers. The first one is the danger of looking back. Ten years went by from the original promise. Nothing happened. Nothing transpired. Nothing different, just Abraham living one day at a time. And then God comes 10 years later and he sort of refines the original promise. He talks about the 400 years. He talks about, uh, verse 18, the geographical size of the promised land. You see, from the Nile River all the way over to uh, the Euphrates River. And what God will often do sometimes, because we'll follow him for a while pretty good, but then we'll want to kind of drift back. We begin to doubt. Did I really hear God right? Is that really what he said? And we'll be, we'll be tested sometimes and, and, and we'll begin to, to stagger at the promises and we'll start to look back. The good old days, you know, it was better back there. I thought by trusting God and walking with God, things were going to happen. But boy, you know, maybe I ought to just go back to where I was before, that looking back syndrome. So what happens many times to protect us from the danger of looking back, which we're all tempted to do, and we all have a tendency to do because we knew how it was back then, we were comfortable with that, we were used to that, that was our place, that was our station, that was our state, that was our thing, and I started following God, and here he is 10 years out, nothing's happened. So God shows up again, and he just sort of refines and and redefines the original promise to him. Here several weeks ago, Wyatt had his puzzles out. He's got a lot of puzzles. Most of them's dinosaur puzzles. Imagine that. And we were picking them up to put them back in the plastic tote thing. And this one, it's kind of a big puzzle. It's got, it's got raptors on it, raptor dinosaurs. Trust me, there's some raptor dinosaurs. And, and so got all the puzzles, pieces, but three of them were missing. So we go scouring under the carpet and, and under the bed and looking for it and found one of the three pieces that were missing. This is several months ago. I do clean the house occasionally. So, so, uh, so I was cleaning the house one day, and I completely forgot about those other puzzle pieces. And lo and behold, the, the vacuum cleaner started making this, this sick, sort of hissing, wailing, wonky, kind of like two cats on a clothesline kind of sound, you know. I thought, what in the world is that? And I got down, and about the time I got down... The, the cord was wrapped around my leg. My legs are kind of long, and the cord was wrapped around my leg. And when I got down to look under the bed, I went like that, and I pulled the cord out, and, and the, the vacuum cleaner belched. 
and it, the dust came out in my face, and, and you know, those, those big old dust bunny things, you know, like dust elephants, what they look like, come out and hit me in the face, and there was those two pieces of the puzzle. And you know, I thought, well, there they are. I hadn't even thought about it. And, and this is how God refines and redefines a promise sometimes. He may not give us all the pieces. He may just give us this big picture like it's on the box. And then he'll fill the pieces in over time. And this is what he's doing with Abraham. And that's to keep us looking for the pieces. That's to keep us looking forward and trusting God. Instead of running to run back where we used to be. And God's not there anymore. He's leading us forward. Remember, a promise is what God gives you to propel you into your future. God wants to lead you forward. It's faith forward. We're going to heaven. It's forward. We don't live back there anymore. We don't live in our sin. We don't live in our past. Yeah, we can go to a reunion if we want to, but we don't stay there. (laughs) And so the danger of looking back. And you may be in a place right now where you've been trusting God and waiting and praying and just nothing's happening. And you're thinking about, hmm, you know, maybe it is, but it's not better back there. It's not. There's some good back there. Yes, there is. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Yes, there is. But God is not there. He's wanting you to reference where you were to help you see where you are so you can get to where you need to be going. So the danger of looking back. Maybe Abraham was really starting to look back and God showed up and said, oh, by the way, dot, dot, dot. And he just threw a couple more pieces in the puzzle. All right, chapter 16. There's a second danger that we get into sometimes when we live on the promises that we need to be careful about, and that's the danger of standing still. If we don't give in to the temptation to look back and drift that direction, we have a tendency sometimes to just sort of get stuck. I don't want to go back. I'm ashamed to go back. I don't want to go forward. I'm afraid to go forward. I think I'll just stay right here. And sometimes we can be guilty of... of, of hammering our tent stakes into the ground a little too deep. You know, Abraham lived in a tent. He'd put his tent down, and then God would say, move. He'd pull his tent up and go. And he never put his tent stakes down too far that he wasn't ready to do what God said. And sometimes we've got to be careful about that. Now, if you know chapter 16, it's one of Abraham's mistakes. When you live on promises, it doesn't mean you'll live perfect. When you trust God, sometimes it's difficult to know what to do and when to do it and how to do it. But Abraham and Sarah, here they are. He's 86 now. Another year's gone by, chapter 15 to 16. And Sarah had been thinking about the promise and how it hadn't come true, the promise to have a child, promised seed, promised covenant child. So Sarah said, uh, verse 16, why don't, uh, chapter 16, verse 1 and 2, why don't you just come in here, Abraham, and uh, get to know Hagar a little bit. <laughs> I don't know how she said it, but Sarah, Abraham's wife, bare no children. She had a handmaid, an Egyptian. Egypt's always a type of the world in the Bible. Worldly lust, worldly desire, sinful stuff. Her name was Hagar, and Sarah said to Abraham, Behold, now the Lord has restrained me from bearing. Now God had promised they were going to have a child together, but she says, No, it's not going to happen. So she kind of got stuck. She wasn't able to move forward. He wasn't able to move forward. So they decided to help God out. Don't try to help God out. He knows what he's up to. He knows what he's doing. But when we get stuck sometimes, we get a little bit itchy, we get a little bit twitchy, we get a little bit antsy, and we think, well, maybe, maybe we should just help God out. And that's what they did. They tried to help God out, and they got an Ishmael out of that, a child of the flesh, that type of thing. So when you're living by the promises, when you're walking by faith, remember this. We do not live by explanation but by expectation. We think we have to have everything figured out before we can take the next step. We think we have to explain what God is doing and understand it analytically, intellectually, academically. Now, the head is involved in following God, but it's always heart first, not head first. The head is engaged, but the heart has got the lead, and this is what they forgot about. They were trying to live according to some kind of explanation. God said it, but it hasn't happened. God has restrained me for bearing. You take her, and we'll go on down the road. It doesn't work that way. So they got stuck, and it didn't work out well. And when you live by promises, 
you avoid the danger, the deadly danger, the terrible tendency of standing still. And I was thinking about Luke chapter 1. Here's little Mary, and the angel Gabriel shows up, and he says to her, you're going to bear a child. And she doesn't say, Luke 1, this can't be. I've never been with a man. She says, how can this be, seeing I know not a man? See, she wasn't looking for an explanation. She was looking for the expectation. That's the difference. When you're living on promises, when you're walking by faith, you're hoping in God, you're trusting in God, you're yielding your life to God. It doesn't have to make sense. I don't have to figure it all out. I just have to do what he says. And that's what Abraham was learning. Now look over chapter 17. When you go from 16 to 17, you go 13 more years. Now Abraham's 99 years old. <laughs> you know, you, you read this and you just think God talked to Abraham every day. He didn't. He makes a promise. He speaks his word. And then time goes by. Is Abraham going to believe? Is he going to trust? Is he going to obey? Or is he going to try to do his own thing? Same thing with us. That's why Abraham's the father of the faithful. So in chapter 17, he's 99 years old. So the original promise, he was 75 now it's almost 25 years later. Nothing has happened. Why has it taken so long? Well, it wouldn't have taken quite as long had they not had chapter 16 in there and tried to help God out. <laughs> However long it takes for God to get done what he wants to get done, if you start helping him out, it's going to take longer. <laughs> so just settle down when you feel like you're getting stuck and walk with God. Chapter 17, we see a third danger that we're protected from, and that's the danger of giving up. The danger of looking back, the danger of standing still, the danger of giving up. I've got to tell you, it's hard to walk by faith. Some days it's hard to trust God when your heart is breaking when your life doesn't make sense and you know it's true and yet you can't give up when you're trusting in the promises of God because they're leading you forward now there's something I haven't been totally honest with you about so far in this message look at verse 5 this is important I've been calling him Abraham but his name's not Abraham until chapter 17 his name is Abram Abram means exalted father Quite a name when you don't have any kids. But now he's going to get renamed Abraham. God makes his original promise to a guy who has one name, significant, symbolic of something about his personality, his character, his relationship with God. And it's going to take him almost 25 years to get him to the point where he can rename him, give him a new name, a new purpose, and fulfill the promises completely and totally. Now, during those 25 years... God's taking care of him. He's a blessing to, to others. He prospers. There's things that God does. Some of his promises he fulfills. Some he delays. But ultimately, he's going to fulfill all of them through Abraham. So the danger of giving up. Verse 5, Neither shall you be called any more Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham. For a father of many nations. That's what Abraham means. Father of a multitude or many nations. You see, Abram to Abraham. What's the difference? Well, it's the... You see that? It's the... That's the difference. And the... Is life. As long as you can... You got life. If you can't... You don't have life. What parent hasn't stirred in the middle of the night, tumbled out of bed, tiptoed into the baby's room, looked across the baby bed with the night light and the moonlight and watched that little chest rise and gone back to bed and slept like a baby. What person hasn't held the, the hand of a, a dying loved one and watched that last breath? And God gives him, gives him life. Gives him something he didn't have before. And he said, Abraham, you're not only going to be the father of the Israelites, you're going to be the father of many nations. I'm going to fulfill that promise to you. 
chapter 23. Abraham says, well, I got a boy named Isaac by Sarah. I got a boy named Ishmael by Hagar. Isaac, he's the patriarch of the Israelites. Ishmael, he's the patriarch of the Arabs. That's not many nations, though. That's just two. And so time goes by. Chapter 23, verse 1 says, Sarah was 127 years old. Ladies, that's the only woman in the Bible whose age is listed. (laughs) She was 127. Guess what? That makes Abraham 137. So you just flipped 37 more years of Abraham's life. Original promise, he's 75. Now he's 137 years old. And he's still not the father of many nations. He's seen God do some things, but he hadn't seen God do everything. He's still living on the promises. And so him and Sarah are just waiting for it all to work out. But then something happens that he hadn't anticipated. His wife dies. Sarah was 127 years old and she died, verse 2, in Kiriath Arbor, the same as Hebron, the land of Canaan. And Abraham came to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. And the rest of chapter 23 is Abraham burying his wife. Chapter 24, he finds a wife for Isaac, his son. And somewhere along the line, Abraham began to think. The Bible is silent on this. It's just my sanctified imagination working overtime. But at some point, it began to germinate in the mind of Abraham, a man who had walked with God, talked with God, seen God do so much, and one day it hit him. If I'm going to be the father of many nations, I need a wife. Sarah's gone. I thought it was going to be me and Sarah. But it looks like God has another plan to fulfill his promise, as Abraham must have said. And in chapter 25, verse 1, it says, Then again... Abraham took a wife, and her name was Keturah, which means incense. And in the scriptures, incense is always sweet fragrance. So I like to think that Abraham, at age 137, saw her walking by and said, Hey, sweetie. (laughs) Hey, sweet thing. Again, my imagination running over time. But Abraham realized that first the promises come to you, but then you must come to the promises. You can't just sit on your haunches when the promises come to you. You've got to follow the promises. The promises are leading you forward. They keep you from looking back. They keep you from standing still. They keep you from giving up. The promises of God. And Abraham realized, look, if I'm going to be the father of many nations, I need somebody. Look at verse 2. Now, he's 137. <laughs> he's about to start a basketball team. <laughs> They're about to buy a four-bedroom house by the grade school. <laughs> My imagination again. She bare him Zimram and Jokshan and Medan and Midian and Ishbak and Shua and on and on it goes. And verse 4 says, the sons of Midian and these were all the children of Keturah. So Abraham had Isaac, Ishmael, and now all these guys. And he becomes the father of many nations. Not through Sarah, his wife. Not through Hagar, the work of the flesh, when they got tired of standing still and waiting on God, but through Keturah, the second wife. The promises were fulfilled. Look at verse 7. I'm almost done. These are the days of the years of Abraham's life, 175 years. He's 75 years old, and God says, Abraham, I will, I will. I will, I will, I will. And a hundred years goes by. He just lives on the promises. 
And every one is fulfilled but one. And it will be fulfilled in the future. Turn back to Romans 4. Let me close this out. In Romans chapter 4, verse 20, 21, he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was also able to perform. And here's the punchline, brothers and sisters. And therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. Now it was not written for his sake alone, but it was imputed to him, but for us also, to whom it shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and raised again for our justification. Last week we talked about how do you stand on the promises. Faith, obedience, patience. Faith will keep you from looking back. Obedience will keep you from standing still. Patience will keep you from giving up. God has made promises, precious promises to you and I. And we are to live on these promises just like Abraham. Here in Romans 4, seven times he's called father of somebody or something. I don't have time to go into all that. But Abraham is ultimately the father of all who believe God. Not just believe in God, but who believe God and who trust God and who will live God's way and do things God's way and obey God God's way. Father, help us to live by the promises. And of course, as we've said many times in this study, how can you live by them if you don't know what they are? So help us to know the promises, to have an understanding, and then to stand on that understanding. Standing on the promises of Christ, my Savior, we say. Standing on the promises of God. Encourage us, reassure us that as we live by the promises of God, we'll be protected from looking back, standing still, and giving up. As we walk by faith, as we obey the instructions you give us, as we stop looking for explanation, and we start living by expectation, as we patiently hope and trust you to take the next step, do the next thing. We know because you're faithful who's promised that right around the corner where we just can't quite yet see, there's something waiting. There's a future waiting. There's a hope waiting. And you want to propel us into your blessings. You want to propel us into your provision. Because many times we don't want to go. We want to look back. We want to stand still. We want to give up. Life's hard. Things are tough. We're confused. We're in pain. Satan's nasty. And sometimes we sin, just like Abraham did. But Father, through it all, you abide faithful. You have promised, and you will provide. You have promised, and you will perform. You have promised, and you ask us to believe you, to trust you, and to live for you. To look away from this world, to look away from its attractions and allurements, and to turn our eyes upon Jesus. Let's sing that together, Todd. What number is that? 320. 320. Let's sing that. Let's stand together. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. Let's sing.
Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strange in the Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the Move across, take somebody by the hand, quietly, quickly, let's sing it softly, turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will Father, help us. Like Abraham, we know you, we believe in you, but we need to believe you. We need to believe your promises. We need to walk by faith and not by sight. We need to long to see your provision, your power, your presence. All these things you promised to us, they're ours as a child of God, but oftentimes we live like paupers in the sense that we don't access your promises. We live under our own energy, our own strength, our own intellect. We try to figure things out. We try to size things up. And you're calling us to walk by faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please you. We know that in our heads, but in our hearts, something's been disconnected. Help us, God. Help us to walk by faith, to live in your promises that you may provide something for us far better than we've ever known. And it's been good. God, you're so good. You're just so good. You bless us far more than we deserve. And yet you're a God who desires to do even more than we can ask or think, the Bible says. (laughs) You're just such a great Father, such a great God. So dismiss us, Lord, today with the the awareness of your thereness that you have a promise, and that promise is like a bridge from where we are to where we're going. And where we're going is where you want us to be what you want us to be doing, how you want us to be living. And just like Abraham, life may twist, it may turn, it may seem to stop at times, but you will perform your promises for your people. And we thank you for that. We thank you for that. Now dismiss us in the name of our Lord and Savior we pray. And everybody said, Amen, amen. amen. God bless you. Have a good afternoon.